Very, very good. Thank you. Welcome to the Wednesday, May 15th, Dr. Cog Board of Directors meeting. Uh, we, it is uh, 5, 6.30 p.m. and this meeting is now in order. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. Thank you. You may be seated. First, uh, we have uh, the roll call, and Pam, you would like to proceed with that? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for Adams County, Steve Odoricio. Thank you. Um, Arapahoe County, Jeff Baker. Here. Thank you. Uh, Boulder County, Claire Levy. Uh, City and County of Broomfield, Austin Ward. Here. Uh, Clear Creek County, Randy Wheelock, George Marlin, uh, City and County of Denver, Adam Paul, Kevin Flynn, Here. thank you, uh, Douglas County, George Teal, yes sir, thank you, uh, Gilpin County, Marie Mornis, thank you, uh, Jefferson County, Andy, her and he uh, online, yep, thank you, um, City of Arvada, Lisa Frey. Uh, Aaron Davis, no. Uh, City of Aurora, Angela Lawson, Here. thank you. Uh, Town of Bennett, Larry Vidim, Here. thank you. Uh, City of Blackhawk, David Spellman. City of Boulder, Nicole Spear, Present. thank you. Town of Bomar, Margot Ramston. Uh, City of Brighton, Greg Mills. Chris Fielder. City of Castle Pines, Deborah Mulvey. Here. Thank you. Uh, Town of Castle Rock, Tim Dietz. Jason Cray. Uh, City of Centennial, Tammy Maher. Thank you. City of Central, Todd Williams. City of Cherry Hills Village, Randy Wheel. Happy to be here. Glad to have you. Uh, City of Commerce City, Steve Douglas. Susan Noble. Uh, City of Decono, Michelle Rog uh, Rogers, Adam Moorhead, okay. City of Edgewater, Steve Conklin. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, City of Inglewood, Othaniel Sierra, Tim Wright, Town of Erie, Ari Harrison. Here. Thank you. Uh, City of Federal Heights, Linda Montoya, or uh, Sarah Dawn Perlston. Uh, Town of Firestone, John uh, Don Cognac, David Whelan. Town of Foxfield, Josie Cockrell, Lisa Jones. Town of Frederick, Wendy Padilla. Thank you. Uh, Town of Georgetown, uh, Lynette Kelsey. Thank you. City of Glendale, uh, Rachel Blinkley. Blinkley, thank you. City of Golden, Paul Hazeman. Thank you. Uh, City of Greenwood Village, George Lance. Here. Thank you. Uh, City of Idaho Springs, Chuck Harmon. City of Lafayette, Brian Wong. Or David Friedman, Friedland. Uh, City of Lakewood, Jeslyn Sharazai. Here. Thank you. Town of, Lark uh, town of Larkspur, uh, Isaac Levy. City of Littleton, Stephen Barr. Or uh, Kyle Schlockler, uh, Town of Lock Bowie, Kat uh, Bristow, which is online. City of Lone Tree, Wynn Shaw. Here. Uh, City of Longmont, Joan Peck. Here. Thank you. Uh, City of Louisville, Judy Kern. Present. Thank you. Uh, Town of Lyons, Holly Rogan. Thank you. Uh, Town of Mead, Colleen Whitlow. Here. Thank you. Town of Morrison, Paul Sutton. Yeah. Thank you. Town of Nederland, uh, Nicole Sterling. Here, Nederland. Nederland, thank you. <laughs> um, City of North Glen, Richard Kondo. Here. Thank you. Town of Parker, John Dyack. Here. Thank you. City of Sheridan, Terrence Kelly. Here. Thank you. 
Town of Superior, Neil Shaw. Thank you. Uh, City of Thornton, Justin Martinez. Sure. Thank you. City of Westminster, Sarah Nermella. Westminster, <laughs> is that what I said? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, City of Wheat Ridge, Bud Starker. Thank you. Um, and then Darius Pakbaz for CDOT. Thank you. Uh, Sally Cheffy. No, okay. And then Brian Welch, RTD. Right here. Thank you. And that is the list, Madam Chair. We do have quorum. So much, Cam. I appreciate that. Our, <laughs> yes. It's, it's more intimidating than. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. So, um, the, our first business in order is a motion to approve the agenda as distributed. Do I have such a motion? Director Teal? If please, the board, I do have a motion to approve the agenda. Is there a second? Director Wheel? Thank you. Motion and a second to approve the agenda. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted and approved. Uh, first item here is the report of the chair. I will say that. Sadly, this is my last meeting to chair this group. I am term limited and I did not want as mayor, so I will miss you all. I would invite you to join me after the meeting in this corner and we'll snap a group photo. So have that. Thank you. Next, a uh, report of the Performance and Engagement Committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. We had one action item and one informational briefing. The action item was that we selected the John V. Christensen Memorial Award winner, and the informational briefing was on um, an update on our award celebration coming up on August 28th, and I hope everybody will join us there. Thank you. Next, the report of the Finance and Budget Committee, a.k.a. F&B. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. You know I love that name, f &B. I know. <laughs> uh, so in today's meeting, we uh, approved a number of action items, uh, namely to continue uh, current existing contracts, as well as, and you're going to receive a more in-depth briefing, uh, some agreements to negotiate and execute that uh, our exalted director will be working on, uh, assuming that the board here at large approves. Exalted director. Exalted. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I'm, I, I think I think I, I, is this really going downhill? Uh, okay, I'm going to stop at this point, but I, I do want to say that I, I will very much miss our our chair, Wynne Shaw. Uh, she's been a great leader, and uh, really appreciate everything that she's done for us. Next is the uh, report of the executive director, Director Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much, and good evening, everybody. Uh, big, I don't think we've, have we met since the board retreat? I'm trying to remember when it was now. It seems, seems like all these weeks run together. But um, for those that were able to attend that, I want to thank you so very, very much. Um, I thought it was a great retreat, personally. Um, I hope you feel the same way. I think we, we, uh, we had really good discussions about a number of topics, and uh, we have included, um, if anybody's interested that wasn't able to attend, the, uh, the presentations, the full slide deck of presentations is on the website in the events calendar. Um, just go to the appropriate date of the board retreat and click on there and you'll, you'll see the full presentation. And of course, we're happy to answer any questions you might have associated with, but you'll be hearing more about some of the outcomes of that retreat in, um, in the coming months. Um, regional housing assessment, I just wanted to highlight the, uh, an informational item that's in your packet this evening regarding the regional housing needs assessment. Um, as we shared with you at previous board work sessions, phase one of the assessment focused on data, and data analysis. The memo that is included in the board packet this evening is, a is the technical background for the data and information that was presented to you at a previous board meeting. The full report um, is being worked on now and should be completed by the July board, uh, board meeting, um, and, but we just wanted to make sure you had some of that additional background. So the information is in there and we'll provide you with the full report um, in, in a couple months. 
I also wanted to draw your attention to an uh, upcoming opportunity for you all. Um, through the Urban Land Institute, or ULI, um, uh, they are designing workshops that are designed for um, this education and capacity building for elected officials called Urban Plan. Or, so they're doing Urban Plan workshops. Um, they're, they're designated to provide engaging and realistic development scenarios to explore the economics of development process. The workshops are facilitated by ULI members in the development and planning profession. And some of our staff have taken, have, uh, have been trained in, in this method and, uh, and we're, we're, we're really hoping, you know, to, well, we're, we're supporting that, uh, that training opportunity for you all. So, uh, so Metro Mayors um, has, has uh, agreed to um, hold, host these workshops. There's one scheduled for July 26th. If there's large demand for it, um, Metro Mayors has uh, agreed to do additional workshops. So um, we will be sending out additional information to you all for those that are interested. And this is just not reserved for mayors, right? This is all locally elected officials. So if you're interested, please um, please reach out and uh, and get that get that on your calendar. Um, award celebration. It was mentioned earlier today that we did um, select. I say we. The Performance and Engagement Committee selected the John V. Christensen Award winner this year. Um, I'm excited about about uh, who that who that person is, and uh, of course that is kept secret until the uh, till the event. So, Performance and Engagement Committee, don't do as I did and blab it out when staff was in the room earlier. I totally <laughs> forgot. But I. <laughs> For them, or that they they won't say anything. Sworn to secrecy. Sworn to secrecy. Um, but the registration is now open, so please reserve your spot. Each director um, gets a um, complimentary um, a ticket for that event. Um, if you wish to bring a guest, it's uh, it's forty nine dollars. So that's basically half the cost, right, Steve? Is at half price for for the for the event. So again, just thank you so very much for your willingness to, to sit there and allow me to keep beating this into your head about the award celebration. But we really do. This is truly your award celebration, and we hope we get as many board directors as possible. Sponsorships, um, you know, we're a little ahead of schedule than, than last year, which is great. Um, but we're nowhere close to where we need to be in order to pull this event off. So if uh, please encourage um, your communities to um, to buy a table and if you have any corporate sponsors sponsor leads please let us know just give us a name and we'll uh, we'll chase them down so thank you all so very much and looking forward to seeing you later on later on in august as we talk about that bike to work day right around the corner june 26th we already have over 400 businesses and employers signed up for the business challenge associated with that's amazing number um, so we'd, uh, you know, we'd love to, um, you know, help you out if you have any questions or you ha have any companies that are, that are interested that would like to, like us to follow up on, we'd be happy to do that as well. So, um, we're, uh, I think every, the t-shirt, t-shirt orders are in Steve. Oh, okay. All right. So if you, if, uh, board members, um, Help us with advertising of this event. Are, um, are, uh, can receive a, a T-shirt. So if you would just click on that QR code or call us website or whatever, and um, and put in your order for that T-shirt, we're going to get the orders in on on Friday, and we'll get them those T-shirts back out to you before the event. Um, okay. Last but not least, I, uh, I I I I want to acknowledge our outgoing board chair. Um, I'm you know it's. It's tough. She's only been in the chair for you know, three months, and I know it, it's short and sweet for sure. <laughs> but uh, but I'm so appreciative of the time, and it's not just the time, of course, that she served in the board chair. She's been a very active participant of this board for many many years, even when she was alternate. Um, she she was involved with the board activities. So I want to thank you. But we do have a, a couple things that we want to do in celebration of your time on the board and acknowledgement. But first of all, um, we have a resolution that we put together that uh, Director Director um, Baker is going to read to you now, and uh, we'll 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 start there. Thank you, uh, Executive Director Rex. I'm making a motion to approve a resolution. A resolution honoring the distinguished contributions of Wynne Shaw, expressing appreciation for her commitment 
to the community of Lone Tree, as well as to the Denver metro area through many years of service on the Denver Regional Council of Government's Board of Directors. Whereas Winshaw joined the Dr. Cog Board of Directors representing the city of Lone Tree in April 2017. And whereas Winshaw has consistently supported Dr. Cog programs, initiatives, and services through her efforts as a board director, as well as through her consistent and visible support um, in her local community, community. And whereas Winshaw was elected to the executive director, uh, I'm sorry, to the executive committee as board treasurer in 2021 and subsequently served as secretary and vice chair. And whereas Winshaw was elected to lead the organization as chair of the Dr. Cog Board of Directors in February 2024. And whereas Winshaw served as chair of Regional Transportation Committee, as a member of the Advisory Committee on Aging, and as chair of the Douglas County Subregional Transportation Forum. And whereas throughout her seven years on the board, Winshaw demonstrated exceptional leadership and gained a reputation amongst her colleagues for her energetic, collegial, collaborative, and respectful approach to addressing the region's most pressing issues. And whereas Winshaw's ever-present smile, affable demeanor, and personal warmth will be sorely missed by Dr. Cog's staff and the board. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Denver Regional Council of Governments and the Board of Directors honors the service of and expresses gratitude and appreciation to Winshaw for her dedication, her distinguished service to the Dr. Cog Board of Directors and to the people of this region. And I ask for a second. 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 <laughs> yes. Uh, Unanimous <everyone>. second. <laughs> All in favor, please say aye. Aye. I'm not going to even ask for any. <laughs> Can we get a quick picture of, of, of Vice Chair Baker and Winshaw with us? Steve's going to take a picture. He'll get it. Oh. It's a halo. <laughs> well, we also have just a, a parting gift um, oh. for you. It's a, I don't know when uh, Flo found this somewhere. It's basically, it's a little, little, little bunch of flowers, <laughs> and this, uh, and it's attached to a wine bottle. No one Flo. That's not a shock, right, Flo? Flo, Flo that one. So, as well as um, sign card from many of Dr. Cog's staff, as well as the executive committee. So, so there you go, Wynn. Thank you so much. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Or 58 straws. Um. Oh, but I look. Listen personally. I I just want to thank Wynn again for for her time and commitment to this organization. I mean, listen. Quite frankly, straight up, she just she's just a great person, more and above everything else. She's so kind. She's always been so responsive to anything that I need. Um, so I want to thank you so very much. I know you're tearing off there. So I just um, I, I will tell you. So going forward, I just wanted to give you guys an update on where we are. Right. So. Um, thankfully, the Articles of Association lays out what the, re what the uh, process is for the filling of a vacancy, a board officer vacancy, and it really provides two options, and it's all at the, uh, um, at the direction of the, the, the remaining board officers. So the remaining board officers had the option of filling any op board officer vacancies by majority vote, or they had the option to kick that to the nominating committee um, to make those appointments. Um, we are working through the traps right now, trying to determine exactly the route that we, we wish to go. And I do say we in this because I did not realize I'm actually a member of the executive committee. And, um, 
So, uh, so this is the one time I can say we. But, a, but a, so we're working through trust. We've had some questions for legal counsel, but I want you to know there will be no gaps in leadership or anything like that because um, Vice Chair, Vice Chair Baker. Once there is an official vacancy, he will become acting chair until such time that he uh, retains that permanently or someone else takes that role. So um, we're good. And as you know, we do not have a June board uh, meeting, but um, we will be communicating. Yeah. I, I, oh, God. <laughs> yeah. No, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> but we will communicate out to you all once the decision is made on the direction and those appointments, if that's appropriate. So, um, so stay tuned on that. Last but not least, Madam Chair, if I may, just real quick, um, I also heard this evening, just recently, that um, this is actually Director Harrison's last meeting as well. He's rolling off the council up in Erie. So, uh, sir, I want to thank you so very much for your time and commitment to this to this organization. I know it's a, it's a, it's. You got to pack a lunch to get down here on board nights. I understand I that. I've got a passport as well. Um, <laughs> no, I, I really appreciate it. Um, as cliche as it sounds, family uh, comes in the in. So oh, I spent the last 10 years working for, on behalf of the town of Erie as both the commissioner um, and then got elected to uh, the Board of Trustees and now the town council. Um, and so it's been a pleasure working with each and every one of you. I know I haven't had an opportunity to meet each of you. Individually, we all suffered through Dr. or through COVID, most of us together, so on Zoom. Um, but uh, I look forward to to watching uh, in the future from the from the chief sheets. So, <laughs> so thank you very much. Appreciate thank you, it. Director, very much. Amen. Madam Chair, that's my report. Thank you so much, and thank you. Um, we're, I've never had a proclamation, so I feel very honored, and uh, it's been my pleasure to serve, and my honor as well. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is our time for public comment, so I will open that, and if you can check, I will read a little bit more uh, that we allow 45, up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to meet public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Have anyone for public this evening? Thank you, Madam Chair. Give it a moment, but I do not see any hands raised online, and I do not see any hands raised in the room. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, I will close the period for public comment, and we'll proceed to approval of the consent agenda. Uh, there are several items, uh, administrative items, that are on the consent agenda. Yeah, I Pardon? Oh, uh, well, Director Starker, uh, would you be happy to second? Sure. <laughs> and I <laughs> will make so a motion much. to approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you very much. Uh, it's moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. Consent agenda is approved. Next, we have two action items this evening. First is a discussion on the approval of the fiscal year 24-25 budget, and Jenny Dock, Director of Administration and Finance, will present to us. Uh, now we're on. <laughs> <laughs> Director Shaw, thank you. Really appreciate you. Anyone that comes through finance and budget becomes my best friend. <laughs> I just appreciate, because that's probably the committee that you have to really like dig into. And I really appreciate your time there and just your overall support for Dr. Cog. So thank you. 
Uh, so thank you, Madam Chair and the Board of Directors for allowing me to present to you the fiscal budget for the upcoming year. Um, forgive me if I read a little bit because we have a lot of stuff to go over and I don't wanna get anything wrong, but hopefully you've had time to review um, the budget that was in your, a budget, in your agenda packet. Um, but for those of you who don't know, and I know we have a lot of new people on the board, I wanna explain to you first just what the budget process looks like. So um, first we start back in February and March. And during this time, um, staff collects data on a number of different budgetary considerations. And that would include uh, projections on health insurance premiums, cost of living adjustments, and uh, trends with some of our member jurisdictions as it relates to market adjustments and merit pools, as well as other economic factors. So that's what we're doing in the beginning. And at this time, division directors work with their staff to draft a budget uh, representative of the initiatives that they feel that they will proceed with in the coming year. In March, the division budgets are reviewed by Doug and myself to ensure budget neutrality and fiscal um, integrity. The budget is brought before the Finance and Budget Committee at that time for initial review. And at that time, they have the opportunity to ask questions and make any kind of um, recommendations for revisions if, if they feel so that that's necessary. In March, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, and then after that, <laughs> once we have the draft budget, we then go to a second meeting with Finance and Budget and that's when um, they are able to then vote to recommend approval by the board of directors, which is where we are at today. So today we're asking you to review the budget and make um, your vote for approving the budget for the next upcoming fiscal year. So a few different things. So this is kind of the big picture of what we're looking at. So the beginning general fund balance for the upcoming year is projected to be approximately $11.26 million or 267, we could say there. Um, it's a healthy beginning fund balance for the organization. So our auditors have historically recommended that we have about three months worth of operating expenses in our general fund. And so we might be fa falling a little bit shy of this. Um, from our last audited statements, it probably should be a little bit closer to 12 million, but we're still in a very healthy position. Revenues are expected to reach approximately 40.5 million with programs operating on a dollar to dollar reimbursement um, from our grantors. That's another reason why we need to have a strong um, beginning balance in that, that general fund. So we look at there um, and our expenses typically match our revenues because we try to be budget neutral again, because we are on mostly a reimbursement base basis for um, our funding. So one thing you will notice is that pass through funds um, are down substantially from the prior year. And so I, I want to point out that actually on this slide, it says about a 34% decrease. It's more like 25%. So that's an error. Um, I apologize for that. But in any case, the decrease is primarily due to a reduction in AAA funding that I think many of you are aware of. Um, however, as we'll discuss in, in some future slides, Dr. Cog has made really good efforts in securing new funding streams that's mitigated that loss. So overall, impact is not that much as we stated prior, we're just about 4.5% down. So this is um, basically representative of our revenue sources. And you'll notice that federal funds total close to 40 million and make up almost 70% of our operating budget. And that's been pretty steady throughout the years. Uh, federal funding typically send, tends to be our, you know, our bigger revenue stream. Uh, state sources of funding come in second at approximately 12.5 million or 22% of the operating budget. 
I'll also point out member contributions represent 3.65% of the total operating budget. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail um, in coming slides. But something that might catch your eye that I wanna draw your attention to if it hasn't already is the Dr. Cog AAA Reserve Fund. So this fund is representative of additional grants and new funding opportunities that Dr. Cog considers to be strong possibilities in the coming fiscal year. But yet we have not entered into agreements on, so we couldn't include it directly in our budget. It's comprised of um, the private and uh, private sector with public sector partnerships. So if you were at the board retreat, you heard a, representa or a pre presentation regarding contract opportunities Dr. Cog is pursuing in integrated healthcare. So part of that reserve fund would be those opportunities that we feel could come to fruition in the coming year, as well as some additional monies in state and federal funding that we're still pursuing. So in order to balance the budget, we have a line item um, that's represented there to help us come actually to be able to maintain the AAA budget. And Doug, I think it was about 500,000 or so that we feel like is really doable. So that 272,000 there is a really conservative number. So year over year, I thought this was interesting. I wanted to provide a snapshot of the agency's budget year over year. And you'll notice that Dr. Cog experienced substantial growth for fiscal year 21-22 through the 23-24 budgets. Um, this year, we do expect a slight decrease in our overall budget of about 4.5%. However, we're still above those funding levels in the first two years there that you'll see represented in that graph. So one of the things we've learned through the years is that we have to be nimble and innovative, and that's key to writing out any funding irregularities that we might have. So I feel like we've done a good job at even through the periods of growth, understanding there could be cutbacks or reductions in certain areas and preparing and planning for those in advance. So, what are we doing knowing that we're losing some revenue in different um, sources? So we've been very active in pursuing new funding opportunities. So here are just a few that are outlined in the 24-25 budget. So the first one we have here is the strengthening mobility and revolutionizing transportation. We call it the SMART grant. Um, others of you may know it as Ride Alliance. So that's contributing about $675,000 to this budget. Then we've also secured an additional $2 million in transportation improvement program set-aside projects through UPWP. We're also successful in renewing a grant from the Federal Highway Safety Administration for work on crash data. That equates to about $196,000. And then earlier this year, Dr. Cog received a $1 million grant from the EPA, which is called the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant. That equates to about $271,000 increase in funding for this year. And knowing that from uh, traditional Older Americans Act and state funding for senior services, uh, funding would be decreased. Dr. Cog reached out to uh, the Colorado Healthcare policy and finance, and we ensured that we would receive an additional $233,000 there for funding transition services. And lastly, we'll just note that Dr. Cogsaf received an additional $200,000 from the Energy Mineral Impact Assistance Fund through DOLA for the housing needs assessment. So if we're gonna take in more money, <laughs> We also have to make sure we're being mindful of our spending. So we want the board to know that we've also made considerations in how we can cut costs to make sure that we remain budget neutral. So we've taken several steps to do so. Um, first, we'll be, we're being mindful of personnel costs. So we're trying to backfill open positions with existing staff when their skills and experience you know, fit within those realms instead of hiring externally. So we're really watching staffing decisions. As a matter of fact, in the budget, you'll see there's only one additional 
position right now that's in consideration in transportation planning operations for that SMART grant that we talked about just a little bit ago. Uh, we've also, let's see here, we've customized or we've, we've decided to put a halt on some of the customizations and upgrades on the AAA um, reporting platform. We're trying to be more careful with our sponsorship opportunities. And also one of the things that I think is, you know, Dr. Cog's done a good job at being innovative with is our, um, our adaptable work environment policy where we're really focusing on teleworking and desk sharing and things of that nature so that we don't have to expand with office space. So being very careful of costs as well. So the last thing to talk about is member dues. And this is my favorite topic because I think it's so important for members of the board to understand what the contributions that you're making to Dr. Cog, what they actually do. And so member contributions are actually only about 3.65% of this operating budget. And it's a very slight increase over last year, just about 1%. And what member contributions do is they allow us to meet match requirements first and foremost, which this year is a little bit over a million dollars. So you may or may not know that some of the grants we receive require that we put in a certain amount of money to cash match what we are receiving from the federal government. So if we don't have member contributions, we could not accept some of those grant funds. So it's really important that we collect those member contributions. They also fund legislative activities. So grant guidelines stipulate from the federal side that you cannot um, put any cash from, from a grant toward legislative activities. So as you know, we have Rich Morrow on staff. We have a contract with the state lobbyists and federal lobbyists that do a lot of work, right, that support all of our communities. And without your match contributions, or your member contributions, we wouldn't be able to pay for those efforts. So that's really important. The member contributions also pay for some other board related activities uh, that are important, such as the quarterly city and county managers meetings, the small communities hot topics forum, our annual board workshop and more. So um, we thank you and are very appreciative of the contributions that each jurisdiction makes it makes a real impact in our communities and um, we're greatly appreciative of it. So that is the budget. I am happy to take some questions. Thank you, Jenny, very nice. And if there are questions for Jenny, just raise your hand. Mr. Vidim. So I wanna be sure that I understood uh, what you said. Are you saying the exclusive or at least the primary reason for the 4.5% uh, uh, drop in funding is, is centered around uh, AAA? It largely is, yes. There's that's also that's some, tragic. yeah, there's also some human transportation services money uh, that was budgeted in prior years that was not budgeted for this year. There was one single thing that should not go unfunded, that would be it. Madam Chair, if I may. Thank you, certainly. No, uh, Director Vidim, thank you, sir, for your comment and your uh, associated with the AAA. I, I, I have a tendency to agree, and quite frankly, um, you know, we, and Rich will talk about this a little bit later. I mean, we were uh, successful in getting an additional $2, $2 million additionally statewide for older adults, but um, it's woefully lacking. I mean, it's, you know, we asked for five million, and quite frankly, that's not even close to what's actually needed. Um, so it's, I'll be honest, we're really looking forward to our, the, the Older Americans Act is being reauthorized this year. While it's supposed to be, it's not gonna be an election year, but hopefully in the first two quarters of uh, 2025, they might get something moving, and we're expecting some, um, you know, some pretty substantial funding increases associated with that. Um, I'll be honest, this has been a really, really rough budget cycle for us, primarily associated with the AAA and some of the reductions that we were seeing. Um, you know, our contractors, um, you know, they, you know, we had about just over $13 million available for contractors this year. We had $23 million of requests. 
And that is that 13 million is a reduction of 5 million from the year previous. And it's primarily due to two things. Um, it was almost a perfect storm with regards to funding. We had a reduction, you know, with the, the ARPA money went away. So stuff related to the, the pandemic went away as well as um, we uh, no longer get uh, this pot of money called homestead monies. So we, we saw substantial reductions. And as a result, I mean, this, you know, ultimately it's services to older adults. You know, we had, you know, one agency that um, requested money for case management, fair amount of money, $650,000, $700,000, couldn't fund them. And it's, it's so unfortunate. And, you know, I mean, our staff are a bunch of social workers and trying to explain why we can't fund these types of services for older adults is just, it's a conversation we shouldn't have to have. Um, so I thank you, sir, for your, your, uh, your interest in that topic. I will tell you, so it, it, only, it didn't only affect our contractors. We had, to, um, we, you know, we had to reduce our budget in the AAA by about $2 million internally. And, um, you know, we were looking at some scenarios that were not ones that I wanted to even consider very early on. Um, thankfully, we were able to, um, to figure something out in which um, we did not lay off any staff. Now we're freezing a number of positions, seven-ish, um, that we're, you know, we're just not hiring, you know, and they come open. So we're trying to right-size the AAA. But I think there's just been a learning opportunity for us, too. It's like, you know, you can't always be chasing money, right? And uh, I think sometimes because we we're so we're so intimate in the details, and we want to help older adults so much that if there's a grant out there, we try to get it. But I think what we've learned is that we have to be sure that that money is sustainable, right? That you know we've seen situations in which we could get like three hundred thousand dollars for a program, but we don't. It's level funding through the years; it doesn't increase, but our costs increase, right? Benefits salary increases, whatever it is. But and if there's not an opportunity for that funding source to inflate as well, then it's something that we're, we're, we're going to take a hard pass on. So, but I will tell you, so when we, and we're not whole as in the AAA, as Jenny mentioned, we have this, this pot of money this time. We've actually um, asked uh, uh, Finance and Budget Committee it would be okay to take some monies from our um, um, general fund our general fund to kind of backfill the AAA. It was a, originally in the original budget draft. It was just over five hundred thousand dollars, but uh, while because we were able to get that additional two million dollars, Dr. Cog's share of that is about eight hundred thousand dollars, of which about two hundred thousand dollars is internal program. So we're able to reduce it to about two hundred and fifty or whatever the number was. So, but we there's about 10 sources of revenue that we believe we have a very legitimate shot of hitting this year, and um, it will more than offset that $250,000. I'm a pretty conservative guy by nature, and um, you know it's not something I'm really you know I'm not a real risk taker when it comes to that type of stuff. But so we so we feel really comfortable about about um, not having to use that general fund money but just having it to be able to balance the budget and hoping we don't have to use it i can go on and on but i won't but i in in closing the maybe that was so in closing of my comments i seriously i just want to thank jenny i know i do this every year but we are so so very lucky to have Jeff, jenny running our uh, finance uh, finance team Administration and Finance Division. Um, I know sometimes she she said this to me that she hates being the director of no, <laughs> but you know what? That's her job, right? And there's nobody that knows federal policy, the contractual obligations, all the various regulations and everything else that we deal with. We deal with so many different funding partners. It is ridiculous. It's like 75 different contracts that we sign, grant contracts that we sign through the years, through a year. So, uh, so we're so lucky to have you, Jenny. So thank you so much. Appreciate you. To Director Con So uh, I was on a business trip to Arizona most recently and uh, <clears throat> had a meeting with the Maricopa Association of Governments. They're kind of our equivalent for metropolitan area. And although they do not have the Area Agency on Aging embedded with them, they actually run something called Age-Friendly Arizona. And so I met with their director and I told her our woes that, uh, you know, out of 23 million, we only got 60% 60, 60 funded. 
And uh, I said, well, you know, how much are you getting funded of your initiative? She said 100%. So this is very interesting. You know, Arizona is a Sunbelt state, quite a few retirees and uh, senior folks living there. And uh, towards the end of the meeting, I won't, I won't go much longer, but she said, you know, uh, if you're having trouble, you know, nothing more better than getting a bunch of people who have a lot of time on their hands to write letters and make phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> you're laughing, but it's like, well, gee, uh, you know, maybe that's what we have to do. Maybe we need to engage some sort of political campaign and, um, <clears throat> I don't know, lay, lay the guilt trip on our elected officials so that they can feel compelled or at least morally uh, compelled or, or motivated to fund the programs for the senior folks. So thank you, Director Vidim. Uh, I, I think this is something that may be worth thinking about. Uh, and Director Martinez, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My uh, question is about the presentation and thank you for providing that. Who um, provided a breakdown of uh, revenue sources, which was very helpful. Um, but <clears throat> I was wondering if there was also a breakdown of the expenses in like a broad category in a similar way with the revenue. Um, I think it'd be interesting to see if there's any uh, fluctuations at, at the category level. That's well, something that's possible. Well, basically, what we have to do to present a balanced budget is that our expenses have to meet our revenue. Um, so more than happy to provide that in a more detailed spreadsheet. Uh, if you look in the agenda packet itself, I think there's a little bit more detail there project by project, but our responsibility is to make sure that per project, our expenses don't exceed our revenue and they don't. Okay, great. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions for Jenny? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Next up is a, oh, oh, I'm sorry. It for an <laughs> you yeah. better believe it is. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a motion slide or do we refer pack? motion to approve the fiscal year 2024-2025 budget. Thank you. And is there a second? Director Flynn? Second. Thank you. Those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say no. The ayes have it, and the motion is adopted. Now audit season, Jenny. <laughs> it's, audit. it's audit, right. The dance. Discussion of Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 Fiscal Year 24 Funding Awards. Travis Noon, Manager, Administration and Finance. Thank you, Travis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, everybody. I appreciate you being here. Um, I have for your consideration today the uh, award, recommended awards for Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 funding. Uh, just some quick background before we get into the actual awards. Uh, Dr. Cog is the designated recipient to Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 funds for the Denver Aurora urbanized area. Uh, these funds are used throughout the area to support capital operating and mobility management projects uh, that benefit older adults and individuals with disabilities. Typically, we release a yearly call for projects. Uh, and we released a call for projects this year in November of 2023. Uh, we received proposals from 10 organizations requesting nearly $4.1 million. Um, there is approximately $3.1 million available for projects for the period beginning July 1, 2024 and ending June 30th, 2025. All of the applications that we received are reviewed by an independent panel uh, who score the applications and make the recommendations that are being presented to you. I do want to touch a little bit on uh, the adjusted amounts available because this was intended to come before you all last month, uh, but we pulled it um, unexpectedly sort of at the last minute. Um, so throughout a lot of our time, you know, doing things, we work a lot on estimates as we allocate funding because we're waiting on federal budgets to be passed. Uh, and so I had originally estimated that there would be $3.3 million available, uh, a portion for federal fiscal year 
2024. Um, that was based on a five-month apportionment that was provided by the FTA in March. Um, unfortunately, uh, when the full year apportionments came out in April, the actual apportionment was $2.9 million, and so we needed to pivot and adjust the awards down to match the actual funding that we were going to receive. Um, looking at this and how to allocate these funds, uh, Dr. Cog looked at projected unspent funding from prior year um, and looking at the internal project specifically um, for Dr. Cog's area agency on aging. Uh, really, based on what the projection of unspent funding there, uh, Dr. Cog's staff is recommending we adjust the Dr. Cog project down uh, from the panel recommended 900,000 down to 516,000 uh, there. Really, based on the, unpro the projected unspent funding that we can carry over, it's going to have minimal impact on the budget for next year. Um, all other projects remain the same. Uh, we felt that it was best to uh, try to keep those projects as recommended as best we could. Uh, these are the recommended projects here on the screen. They are also in your packet with uh, the amount that they requested on there. Um, as the committee was making these recommendations, uh, they really were prioritizing operating and mobility management projects. Those are generally direct service projects to older adults and individuals with disabilities um, and man maintaining those levels so that level the services would remain the same throughout the region. Um, then looking with funding that was made of it remaining, they looked at the capital projects and again, kind of thinking in that same vein of maintaining service levels. Uh, the, they focused on uh, funding capital replacement vehicles um, over any sort of expansion or the software available. Uh, the scores here really are based on a variety of factors. All projects are scored uh, based on the compatibility with Dr. Cog's coordinated transit plan and whether or not they're innovative and transferable. Um, then depending on the project type, operating mobility management, for example, you also add in the need for the service, financial need of those organizations. Looking at vehicles, they also look at uh, state of good repair if they're replacing a vehicle or the need for service expansion if they're buying a new vehicle. Um, there were three projects that weren't recommended for funding. Again, uh, looking at the uh, expansion vehicle there from sport management that wasn't recommended, the priority was to, to replace the two vehicles that were severely old, pretty old and outdated and really in need of replacement. Uh, the two software projects, uh, the committees did have concerns um, over the uh, sort of readiness of those two projects and whether or not they would be able to get off the ground, which is why they weren't. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that the committee, the board has. Um, this is the recommended motion. Up on. Thank you very much, Director Flynn. Thank you. Okay, there we go. Uh, Travis, uh, what considerations does the uh, committee take into account and they fully fund some and take substantial reductions in other requests what are the way way in that uh, I notice there's not that it should be balanced across the board but what what, what are the things that they look at yeah um, and, and and a lot of that is driven by the scores of those proposals and so the higher scored proposals generally uh, were either level funded or cut less there um, and that Again, it's looking at a variety of factors, right? The financial need, uh, what, how expand, like how they, how much service they provide, right? So, um, and different factors there. Um, with the vehicles, you know, um, kind of one or all or nothing, or if they ask for five, they might get three or two or whatever it may be, right? But um, so it kind of depends. Looking at what they're actually trying to replace. So some of the vehicles that were proposed to be replaced for less than five years old you know, only had 20, 30,000 miles on them, and those aren't outside of useful life, and so really they're not needing to be replaced. So it's a variety of things depending on the project. All right, thank you. Thank you. Other questions for Travis? I have a motion, so I look for a motion. Uh, Director Ward, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I move to approve the... FTA Section 5310 awards for the period of July 1st, 2024 and ending June 30th, 2025, as recommended by the review panel adjusted by Dr. Cog's staff. Thank you. Is there a second, Director Hazeman? Second. Thank you. Moved and seconded uh, to approve the motion as presented by staff. Further discussion? 
Those, those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. And the motion is adopted. Next, we have informational briefings. The active transportation plan update with Aaron Villery, planning, uh, planner, transportation planning and operations. Aaron. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and thank you all. Um, so my name is Aaron Villery. Uh, I'm a Senior Active Transportation Planner uh, in our Transportation Plan and Operations Division. Um, and I uh, wanted to give uh, folks an update on uh, our uh, just kicking off uh, the transportation planning process. Um, so uh, this is a major update. The, the last, uh, the current active transportation plan was last adopted in 2019. So this is a major uh, sort, of, sort of full front to back update of that active transportation plan. Uh, this was uh, identified uh, in our current UPWP. Um, and really the goal of this is, is to give Dr. Cog a, a vision, to provide the vision for supporting walking, bicycling, and uh, other active modes of transportation throughout the region. And, and so this provides that roadmap to do so. Um, it uh, relates and specifically covers Dr. Cog's internal projects and programs and our work with partners uh, throughout the region. And really we wanna to respond to emerging trends and challenges in active mobility. And, and kind of the place I wanna start is why do this and why do it now? Um, so really, uh, the, the threefold reason that we want to update the active transportation plan right now and really revisit it and rethink it from the ground up is we're facing a lot of pressing challenges over the past five years, uh, but we've also seen a lot of exciting innovations throughout the region and the uh, seismic changes in how people move around the region. Uh, and so we really want to address those and, and think strategically about how um, sort of in, in, in our new normal and our, our post-COVID normal um, to be settling into uh, how do we think about uh, walking and bicycling and active mobility uh, throughout the region. So just to start to itemize some of those challenges, uh, the last time I spoke to you was about our active modes crash report that was released in, uh, in or I believe the uh, last time I was here was November, it was released in October. Uh, but we really identified that we're in the midst of uh, a pretty significant um, pedestrian safety crisis, both uh, within the region and nationally. Um, region, we've seen pedestrian uh, uh, fatal and severe injury crashes increase uh, and over a decade. Um, so we, we, we really want to make sure that we're um, uh, deploying the best strategies consistent with our zero policy uh, to address that crisis. Um, escalating cost to implement. Uh, I'm, I'm sure this is, this is not a strange topic to any of you that, um, that, that the, the landscape of delivering projects, especially active transportation projects, has really changed. Uh, for, for many of your jurisdictions um, and nationally. Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, new and emerging modes, new types of vehicles, e-bikes, scooters, new things that are on our, our uh, streets and roadways and, and trail systems uh, that we're all sort of grappling with how to, how to accommodate um, and addressing congestion and air quality issues as the region grows. Um, however, uh, Denver and, and the region has really become, and the state, um, has become sort of a hotbed of exciting innovations that we're, we've seen a lot of shifts in design best practices in the way that uh, jurisdictions around the region are uh, rolling out uh, walk and bike facilities. Uh, and so we wanna make sure to capture some of those innovations and, and cre create a collaborative space for, uh, for local and, and county governments to, to share practices. Um, uh, some shifts in planning and delivery approaches. We want to and share lessons in, in how you all are delivering work and, and thinking about uh, uh, serving people using active transportation. Um, again, new device types. That, um, think about e-bikes and scooters. These are new challenges, but they're also new opportunities, new types of people who uh, might have faced barriers or seen those barriers fall or, or be reduced. Um, and so there's more options for people of all ages and abilities to uh, use after transportation and to get around in more ways. We're seeing, we've become sort of a national epicenter and a national leader in providing public incentives and new funding opportunities to, to encourage more people to use active transportation. Specifically, we might all think of e-bike rebates, but there are all these sort of new ways to, to encourage more people to use active transportation. And then finally, a shifting landscape. We know that uh, the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic really changed track 
travel habits and we sort of settled into uh, uh, perhaps a new normal. Uh, we'll see. Check in five years, I suppose. But um, uh, the way that we get around the region has really changed. We've seen an evolution in shared micromobility, um, which is to say e-bikes and, and shared e-bikes and shared e-scooters um, that are deployed on, in uh, jurisdictions around the region. Uh, that has really changed since 2019, since the last time we revisited this. And so we want to capture some of that evolution um, and, and provide some, some guidance going forward. Um, the expansion of, of e-bikes and, and micromobility options. And then uh, finally shifting cost burden and economic pressure. We, we, we look at transportation uh, within the, the sort of interlocking context of all the uh, housing and land use and, and other planning issues. So we really want to uh, be sure that we're integrated with other regional planning efforts. So that gives the context and so the purpose of the, the Regional Active Transportation Plan um, is to provide that updated vision for walking and bicycling uh, throughout the region. Uh, it'll provide tools and guidance uh, for local agencies and, and uh, to implement projects in your respective jurisdictions. Um, and it'll identify actions for Dr. Cog as an agency uh, to support these efforts. So I want to talk a little bit, uh, just introduce you to, to some of the things that we've included uh, in the scope for this project. So we're, we're planning for this project to take about 18 months, uh, start to finish. Um, and we are, uh, we've just come under contract with the consultant team. Uh, so we are, uh, so I want to talk through what are the big things that we're really going to be focusing on uh, as part of this planning process and, and sort of use this as an opportunity to uh, invite uh, uh, you all in and, and us, uh, ask for feedback. Um, First and, and biggest, of course, is member and stakeholder capacity building and uh, engagement. And so we're, we're really focusing this plan on engaging with our member governments, uh, providing shared space to learn from each other, um, and providing uh, space to, to learn from key stakeholder groups. So we're really thinking about targeted opportunities to uh, engage with folks who face barriers to using um, the walking and biking system throughout the region. We want to be really strategic about our engagement, but spend a lot of effort um, collecting feedback and things that we can really act on and, and reflect on and, and make sure we're delivering an equitable uh, active transportation system. Uh, of course, we want to update the regional active transportation network. So this is one of the uh, principal ways that the, the rubber really hits the road. Um, so we have uh, an, an active transportation network um, that is three-pronged and that we use uh, in a, a lot of our, our tools, such as uh, the TIP. Um, the, the principal vehicle for that, but um, updating that network to provide guidance for what the regional um, walk and bike system looks like. Um, developing guidance to accelerate completion of the regional pedestrian network. I'm sort of calling this the sidewalk delivery guide, which is um, developing an actionable guidance document to help people deliver missing gaps and uh, upgrade uh, uh, sidewalk facilities to ADA compliance. Um, since the last plan, we now have a new uh, federal standard, uh, PROAG, the Public Right-of-Way Accessibility Guidelines um, uh, that are required for uh, accessible uh, walk-in facilities and facilities for facility devices. And so we want to develop some guidance to, to help uh, local jurisdictions uh, actually roll out um, and, and sidewalk networks. Um, we want to provide update when, when we say update guidance for emerging micromobility design and infrastructure. Uh, what we really think of is is how to accommodate all those different vehicles um, and more users um, using uh, trails and paths and and uh, separated bike lanes and on street bike lanes and and so bringing together and sharing practices around how to accommodate different uh, new types of vehicles. Uh, so we'll be developing some guidance and, and case studies uh, around that. Um, and then one of the things I'm very excited about, number five, is analyzing the economic benefits of active transportation investments. And so we're, we're uh, scoped in, in looking to look at what is the sort of life cycle cost and benefit of implementing um, sidewalk and bike facilities specifically and, and sort of what are some of the local economic impacts that we can expect from some of those so that we can um, we can help make the case and, and sort of talk about justification for investing in some local infrastructure um, and and give our members more tools uh, to, to assess uh, your transportation systems. 
Uh, finally, assessing Dr. Cog programs and policies, so taking a good look at, at what are our practices, what are our programs and opportunities as an agency to, um, to promote this work, and finally producing an actionable plan so that at the end of this planning process, we are uh, ready to deliver something and implement. So just to um, uh, sort of close out with, uh, with our, our um, call to action a little bit. Uh, so. Uh, I want to talk about the project team and stakeholders. So, of course, we're develop, you know, we want to develop this plan with a plan advisory group that will work very closely, that will review key deliverables throughout the process, that will be sort of the, the engine that drives. Um, so Dr. Cog's staff, um, our member governments, and uh, our partners, CDOT and RTD, are, are, are the principal uh, stakeholders that we see as, as really um, working on this plan. Uh, we want to engage subject matter experts from around these agencies. Um, that start with people who are working directly on active transportation, but also include people who um, may have other roles that, that really do uh, interconnect with active transportation um, and are really critical but might not be the first thought. So uh, ADA coordinators, state process school, school managers, things like that, that uh, we really want to make sure are represented as key users in active transportation. In addition to this core member advisory group, we're also engaging um, and developing a community advisory group um, that includes a, a really a mix of, we want to be multidisciplinary about this and think about who really uses and understands and has expertise in the transportation system. So of course, uh, organizations that are deeply involved in safe streets and walking and biking, uh, parks and recreation districts, transportation management associations, uh, but also moving beyond that um, to things like accessibility advocates, we really want to focus accessibility in this plan and, and think about the different populations that uh, encounter barriers to walking and biking and, and understanding those. Um, also thinking about the sort of rich social network of, of bike shops and organized rides and social clubs and engaging some of those people um, uh, and, and important stakeholders. Uh, throughout the process, business improvement districts, micromobility operators, there are a number of those. And, and uh, one of the things I do want to uh, call out is, is who else? Um, who are we not thinking of? You know, so I want to make that invitation uh, that we really want to make sure that we're bringing in people who understand and have expertise about the system. And finally, just to give you a, a sort of broad overview of the schedule, so we're um, we're kicking off the plan now um, and really uh, looking to to start this spring and summer to, to roll right into stakeholder engagement and public engagement and, and really uh, uh, hit the ground running um, uh, and continue through the summer into the fall and then planning to really do produ uh, plan production uh, early and middle of next year. So uh, really looking to uh, extend this through 2024 into 2025. Uh, with that, uh, I really appreciate your time and uh, I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there questions for Aaron? Yes. Thank you. Director Nerman. Hi, yes. I just was wondering how we can get our staff involved in this. Absolutely. So um, there will be a call going out to uh, uh, all, we have an active transportation distribution list that we've typically engaged um, and we're thinking creatively about uh, how to engage uh, more people and, and make sure that we're touching the right um, uh, stakeholders within cities and staff, but also say that um, my content information is up on the screen and, and um, if there are staff in your town that um, you really want to make sure are aware of this, please feel free to uh, send an email, refer them to me, and, and um, we definitely want to make sure that we connect with all of our member governments as we start this and, and make sure that we give uh, you all a, an on-ramp to participate in the plan. So. Um, we'll be sending out that initial outreach, um, but if there are folks that you want to make sure are looped in, send them my way, and I'll be excited to talk with them. Other questions for Aaron? Uh, yes, Director Harrison. Um, in terms of the demographics that you're trying to shoot for, can you speak a little to that? Um, and knowing full well that we've all had a briefing about what the next like in terms of population of aging? Absolutely, um, and, and thank you for the question. It's, it, it's, um, I was kind of hoping to be asked that, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> right before I leave. Uh, um, so the, the, the way that I'm really approaching this is, um, 
just because we have, you know, we want to be really strategic about our time. I'm really thinking a lot about and soliciting a lot of uh, input about who faces barriers to the active transportation system. You know, I, I think one thing, a, a concept we might be familiar with, curb cut theory, right? We talk about curb cuts as as an intervention that is targeted to a population, uh, in the, you know, specifically wheelchair users who face a barrier in the transportation system, but really benefits everyone. And so we really want to think about who experiences barriers to walking and bicycling and how do we uh, break down those barriers. So to get into specifics, we're thinking about children and families, older adults, um, people with disabilities, of course, um, thinking, about, uh, thinking about people with uh, low English uh, proficiency um, uh, who might one of the things that we've talked about is, is like refugee populations who might have barriers to getting driver's licenses or things like that, or um, who are going to be the people that use the system um, but might have some uh, outside perspective or some perspective that we haven't engaged significantly enough in the past to, to really understand how we can address those through this plan. Um, I think if there are any, what else I'm missing? Um, Uh, th those are the ones that really jump to mind, I would say, right now, but, but especially thinking of people using mobility devices, people pushing strollers, people um, who are using adaptive uh, bicycles, things like that. We really want to think about those different types of bodies and experience. System. Yes, Director Kondo. Um, so you brought up a great question, Director uh, Harrison, and it kind of leads me to my question, which is, uh, would autonomous electric vehicles, say like Waymo or May Mobility, be part of this in terms of trying to get people at first or last mile to connect to a mass transit mobility modality? Yeah. So uh, like the word M. Anyway. Can you answer that? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll say it holistically. We are we're trying to think about um, you know all those factors like connections to transit and emerging mobility. You know, so how do people um, you know as, as we develop the network, we think about like what are those key nodes and find those nodes. So um, uh, specifically, you know, frequent transit hubs, major transit stations. Um, I will say the, the thing that we're really focused on is um, that's really changed in people's travel patterns over the past five years is sort of like what are the what are the key trips that people are most likely to make walking or bicycling um, and how do we connect those? So we've kind of structured in, in the previous plan and this plan, we've, we've structured our network around, uh, I, I spoke about the three-pronged network and it's really regional corridors, so linear corridors uh, that are sort of like regional roadways um, and paths and trails, uh, but also we call them short trip opportunity zones and pedestrian focus areas. And so these use um, either, you know, our, our travel model and, and uh, different tools we have to understand where there are a lot of short vehicle trips and opportunities to convert <coughs> um, some of those discretionary trips to walking or bicycling. And then where are some of those demographic um, indicators of likelihood to walk or bicycle? We're going to be revisiting that, and so it's a good consideration to think about new technologies and how those um, might augment the transportation system in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, but I think the thing that we're really looking for is, is sort of where in the puzzle does uh, walking and bicycling fit, and where's the opportunity to um, shift some of those trips, because um, we think about 40%, I, I believe, of, um, of trips are, are two miles or less in the region. There's a really huge number of trips that, that we think we can shift or, or capture um, through active transportation, and that has a significant impact on congestion and air quality and, and safety and all those things. So we're really sort of thinking about where in the puzzle does it fit. Yeah, well, uh, last summer, I went during that air, air, air uh, period, I did take the end line to Dr. Cog. Unfortunately, I was I was too afraid to use a scooter to make that. <laughs> so I, I think I'm going to try and do that this year. And if I show up with a head injury, uh, you'll know why. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Director Spear. Okay. 
Um, and one of the things I bring up in, in town of Erie, um, when it comes to sidewalks, for instance, and what, try, what people tend to use, um, Erie obviously has a, an old urban core, and then it's spread out like a lot of other communities might be. Um, but the sidewalks that, for instance, where I live, connecting to downtown, there isn't any. And the way that that gets built is by developers putting money into it to get the sidewalks done. So for, for those metro district areas, can you talk, has, has metro districts ever come into that in terms of, of that little, because it's a, it's a nuanced sort of area. Yeah. In yeah. To that. yeah. And, and I think the way that, um, so a absolutely. Yeah. And it's something that we're, we're talking about sort of in the context of a, of a couple projects we're working on, but, um, it's one of the really key pieces of like the sidewalk delivery guide that we think about is is having you know not just those network areas, um, uh, that we we want to focus you know for instance funding opportunities and um, project development um, to infill some of the sidewalk gaps, but also providing guidance um, just you know some some sort of off the shelf best practices around you know that that uh, member governments can really point to and say like this is you know, an accessible, comfortable sidewalk facility, and and here's some practices around delivering that. So try to capture, you know, what are the facilities that can be built during redevelopment. It's a thing to sort of infill a lot of these projects um, is just to have like this is a um, a comfortable sidewalk in this context, and you know, some methods to actually uh, get that built out. And so providing that mix of you know where do we think we want to focus, um, where's the highest priority for um, targeting sidewalk infill, and then also having guidance so that when those opportunities come up and you opportunistic and um, say that this is the, the designated facility. The idea is, is that if you have roadway templates, if you have um, standard designs, that, that this might provide um, some backing or some guidance on how to you can develop those so you get the facilities that you want. Thank you. Director Spear. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. Just uh, thanks for um, the work that you do on the active transportation plan. Our staff were noting that it's been a really important resource for them as they've been applying for planning and uh, for project grants on corridors identified the um, regional active transportation network. So I just wanted to thank you for all of that work. And um, I think it's for the county of Boulder as well. Um, offer that too, but thank you. Thank you. And Director Levy. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have been noticing, you, you mentioned all the, the micro-mobility, you know, particularly scooters, and, you know, we've, we're used to thinking about sidewalks for pedestrians and, you know, a bike lane, bike path of some sort for cyclists. And Scooters don't really seem to fit anywhere. And I'm just wondering, you know, as, as templates are updated, design guidelines are updated, what the thinking is about where scooters belong? Yeah. Um, I would say that's one of the reasons that it's really critical for us to do the plan so that we can start to develop that, that consensus and, and sort of shared understanding as a region. Um, and to have that task that focuses on sort of micromobility design guidance and practices. Um, I think, you know, sort of just speaking what I've, what I've talked to uh, when I talk to member staff, um, of these initial conversations is that speed differential is, is kind of the big animating factor, I think. And in a lot of cases that scooters, you know, might, um, be going 20 miles an hour, um, and that feels cool if, Adjacent to someone who's walking three or four miles an hour, um, uh, and and so starting to classify, you know, where where does it make sense to separate? Where are some of these things um, appropriate versus inappropriate? You know, are there are there path environments where, for instance, where scooters um, can coexist, you know, sort of peacefully and uh, with you know with with conflicts and interactions with with walking and where do you start to need to separate some of those uses um, and so I, I, I think it's it's a major focus of ours to um, just you know, the, the sort of national best practice on this is not settled 
um, it's very much an open question, and so I think we want to get our hands around. <laughs> Thank you, and I know I'd had a question about uh, uh, a more stable version of the bicycle, which might involve an extra wheel or two. So, um, you know, making sure that there is some thought being given uh, serving a population who may be stable and uh, might something a little like that. So, thank you. other questions? All right, Erin, thank you. Next is RTD Fast Track's annual report. And we have uh, Brian Welch, Assistant General Manager, Regional Transportation District, and Michael Davies, RTD's Government Relations Office. Well, good evening. Dr. Cog board members, Chair Shaw, I'm gonna miss you. We all are gonna miss you. One of our favorite elected officials of all time. Well, if you hear Brian Welch speaking, the first thing you're gonna think is, wait, the meeting's almost over. It's RGD. <laughs> but not yet. At any rate, I'll, I'll be joined this evening by Michael Davies, our government relations officer. It turned out that one of the things that did uh, make it out of the legislature and we anticipate will be signed by the governor tomorrow relates to the Fast Tracks program. So I'm gonna ask him to highlight that. The, uh, many, as many of you know, RTD has a special relationship with Dr. Cog when it comes to system expansion. It, it's different than the federal requirements that are across the nation for metropolitan planning organizations. We have specific state legislation that requires the RTD Board of Directors to approve any system expansion that RTD, that our Board of Directors chooses to do before we can proceed. And that's, that's fairly unique, but it was, it was intentional by the state legislature recognizing that it is a regional system expansion program. What we do every year is we provide, uh, by, according to legislation, an update on the program, and that's what I'll do this evening. The program, as you know, it's uh, 20 years old, believe it or not. 2004 is when the vote was passed for the four-tenths of a percent. Many of you know many of the milestones in the program. You, you've been around for the opening of the A-Line to the airport and many other projects that have been completed. I think when we talk about fast tracks, unfortunately, and I won't make excuses, I won't give reasons either, um, people talk about what hasn't been finished, but. $5.6 billion worth of projects has been accomplished, which, which we should all be proud of as a region. I know we are still all committed as well to finishing the program, but we should be um, pleased that we have been able to make those mobility improvements to uh, these parts of the region, which are shown on the screen here. The, as I indicated, the, 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 the amount that has been spent through 2020 is, is very significant. And as you notice, I included slides related to the cost of transit and highway projects and what's been happening recently. And I know many of you as elected officials, as you've been in your, uh, your city council board meetings, you probably had staff telling you what's been happening lately with uh, cost estimates and then what projects are coming in. Uh, it's, it's happening at the local level, the state level, the national level. And why would I bring this up during Fast Tracks? Well, the, the, the Fast Tracks program, if we tried to do this now, if we hadn't started in 2004, again, I apologize that we're not finished, the, it would probably cost three times as much, we think. So we did get $5.6 billion worth of improvements in before we've experienced some of these challenges. I excerpted these side, slides to, to pass that message along, but also to let you know that we we need to be very cautious now when we start thinking about future system expansion in the United States. It's become very, very challenging. Uh, when you think about the big picture, and I'm not the expert, so don't ask me any follow-up questions, but th what's been happening is when you inject trillions of dollars into the economy, nothing wrong with that, I guess, at any rate, and you have um, labor shortages, supply shortages, um, 
a lot more demand for not as much ability to supply. What, what you see happening is some pretty dramatic changes in terms of cost overall. This is, these, are, these slides are ex excerpts from a presentation that Peter Rogoff, who is a former FTA administrator, made to uh, APTA CEOs to describe. And I think it helped everybody get a better picture of is it just us or what's going on. The, uh, if you look at these graphs, these are not the kind of graphs you want to see if you're trying to introduce and build new projects. Tremendous pressure from a number of different areas all at the same time. And for those of you who are around, if you remember what Fast Tracks faced 2011, 2012, 2013, when we realized that we had a budget that was likely not going to be able to meet the original program. And, and we did a lot of different things, one of which Michael Davies will talk about, which is the Fast Tracks internal savings account. Here's some examples of, of some of the alarming things that would happen, and you could ask yourself, well, are, are engineers dumb? You know, are they terrible at, at doing, and it's, no, that's not the case. Um, people are finding that their cost estimates in all of the work that they do are just no longer reliable in such a volatile environment. These are transit projects in particular um, the, the East Colfax Bus Rapid Transit Project is one of these projects, very similar uh, conditions that we're facing. So what I'd like to do now is uh, let Michael Davies come up because he's got some additional information. You know what I'm going to do, though? I, I think, Michael, I'm just going to finish the other slides because we can transition to you. Quick um, update on Northwest Rail Peak Service Study. It's uh, what I talked, I talked to the project manager yesterday and he said the best thing I could share is that it will be finished later this year. <laughs> we, I, again, I apologize, we still do not have the information that we need from the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad. As you know, this is the first project in Fast Tracks that is utilizing track that doesn't belong to you, to RTD, so it's more complex. We need critical information from BNSF that regards to what kind of sightings they need. I think many of you who are in the corridor know what these issues are. We don't have that information yet, so we can't uh, tell you exactly when we will have it either, but it will be finished later this year. So with that, I'm going to introduce Michael Davies. Michael, please take over. Brian, um, hello, Chair, members of the board. I'm Michael Davies, Government Relations Officer for RTD. And Brian has just asked me to touch on a few pieces of legislation that just went through this legislative session that relate to RTD's Fast Tracks program. First is uh, SB 230, that's oil and gas production fees. And so this bill, which uh, is scheduled to be signed by tomorrow by the governor, um, uh, put some fees on oil and gas production. Those fees go into a pot of money. 80% of that pot will go to rail or transit or passenger rail. 70% of that 80%, and sorry for throwing around so many different uh, little chunks here, 70% of that will go to a formula-based uh, grant fund that essentially the Clean Transit Enterprise Board has yet to determine, but they will. And when those, when those funds get there, it will move forward. Those funds can be used for new and expanding transit. And so when you think of fast tracks, that's obviously new and expanding transit. So it's available and eligible for that purpose. There's a 10% pot of money and that's a competitive uh, grant fund. And that again is for expanding transit services. So don't think of just the same transit services there, it's expanding transit. And then lastly, there's a 20% pot really for passenger rail. And inside that passenger rail piece, it does stipulate that it has to be additive to RTD's FISA account. So if, RTD, if RTD's board were to make decisions to uh, use some of the FISA account toward any of those fast tracks projects, it would have to be additive if we were gonna go and try to use some of the new SB 230 funding there. Um, and, and lastly, as a part of that SB 230 legislation, there is a requirement that RGD produce a report by July 1st, 2025 on how RTD would finish all unfinished fast tracks projects. 
by 2034, but does put some, put some priority on two specific projects, and that's the Northwest Corridor and the end line that are specifically called out in that legislation. Moving to the other piece of legislation, it is SB 24184, and that's Support Surface Transportation Infrastructure Development. This put uh, fees on rental car, um, uh, uh, rental car purchases, and ultimately those funds are available for passenger rail, um, well, really for all surface transportation projects as defined in the bill, but a lot of it is uh, uh, certainly geared and in intention to go toward uh, passenger rail, front range passenger rail, et cetera. Um, as part of that legislation, there are requirements for RTD to work with uh, um, front range passenger rail, CDOT, and CTIO to produce a series of reports. The first report being September 30th, 2024. So that, that will come up on us quick, but um, those reports really are to look at the corridor between Denver and Fort Collins which certainly interacts with RTD's Northwest Rail Fast Tracks project. So just want to make sure you're all aware and there, there will be interaction between RTD and those pieces of legislation. And that's all I have. Thank you. So we are not going to take any questions. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, no tough questions. No, we're, we're here, uh, both Michael and I, um, if you do, if any of the directors do have questions. Great presentation, and Director Ward first, then Director Lance. Uh, thank you, Chair. Brian, too bad you're sitting next to me. All right, I still get <laughs> questions. <laughs> um, thank you guys for the presentation. I, my first question, and probably the only question I'm going to have, is how does the money that's coming from the oil and gas fees along with the rental car fees factor into RTD's ability to fully complete fast tracks projects by the deadline established in um, the other transportation bills without, and does that not require any additional funding from taxpayers, grant sources, et cetera? Hopefully that question makes sense. I can reword it if not. I'll, I'll try to give you an answer and, and see if it gets to it. Um, one, very hard to say exactly how much money is going to be produced out of that bill. I, you know, there's an average estimate that they uh, put on the bill of the, that might be produced. Because the formula grant program hasn't been developed yet, RTD has absolutely no idea exactly how much RTD will get out of that grant fund. And so I think that that is part of what we'll be looking at for that study that's due, the study that is, is a part of the requirements of 230 is due by July 1st, 2025. So I think that will be a big part of that topic is to say, here's what we think we can estimate that comes out of those grant funds. Here's how much RTD has in FISA. Here's how much we can uh, uh, imagine that might be available elsewhere and really uh, try to lay that out for the public on exactly how we would get there, and if there is additional funding that would be required uh, uh, to be sought. Okay. Um, two follow-up questions related to the uh, SB 230. Um, in that report, will RTD also be laying out the maintenance operating costs, because obviously these grants are just for capital construction, um, knowing that the current fast track tax not enough for full build out to maintain the system as it currently stands. So will that be included in report one? And two, when the state legislature required that report on how to finish fast tracks, what does finish mean? Does it mean what was fully promised to the voters in that you have frequencies that are matched, uh, like for example, the Northwest rail line was supposed to have 55 trains a day. Or, so will that be part of finished or is finished, we're just giving you a line and we're gonna have a different level of service than what was promised in the original vote? Yeah, great question. Um, on the first piece, 
So the grant funds actually do allow operations to be a part of that. So it is both capital and operating, which is great news for RTD. We've been constantly trying to uh, uh, beat that drum with the state legislature that operating funds are critically important for, for any of these projects. Um, so that will be a part of the report in that aspect. The, the second piece, it does not define exactly what finished means in the legislation. So I think that's up to all of us to kind of collectively determine, as you mentioned, you know, we're doing the peak service study now, which is clearly not what the original full fast tracks plan was. So I, I think it's what, what funding do we have? How much can we do? And does that satisfy the public's need for what we think we can deliver and, and put in those reports? Okay, thank you. I won't be on any further. Thank you, Director Lance. Thank you. A question on the funding. You said that 10% of the funds was out of oil and gas was competitive. Now, I got 80% and then you talked about 70% being formula-based. And then you went to 10, and I don't know where the 10s come from. Then you add 20. My math says that's 110, so I don't know where, where that's coming from. Could you clarify that for me? Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, and sorry that was so confusing. So the, out of the 80%, and that's what we're talking about that's available for transit, and then out of that 80%, it breaks down into 70, 10, and 20. So the 10 out of that 80 is the competitive piece. And again, available for operations and capital expenses. 8%. So I guess you could say 80% is available for capital and operating expenses on transit <laughs> out of the 80%. 80%. Thank you. And Director Martinez, and we have Director Nermella, Odoricio, and Flynn. Great. Thank you. Well, my question is about the uh, the prioritization of the two projects. Um, you mentioned the Northwest Corridor and the end line, and <clears throat> there's some concern am among my colleagues about the definition of those projects, one being Northwest Corridor and end line, whether they're being mentioned as the, the rail lines as they exist, or can, so, so my question is, is there any way that those provisions can be interpreted to be anything other than completing the rail line itself, the N line, and the B line as uh, proposed? It's a little concern uh, that, you know, down the road that can be interpreted as, you know, some other form of enhancing those corridors versus actually completing the rail line that Fast Tracks was about originally. Yeah, thank you, and it's a, it's a great question. The bill does refer to it as the Northwest Corridor and the North Corridor. So, you know, those, those were the references that when, if you look back in the original Fast Tracks uh, uh, legislation plan, that's how that was referenced in there. So I, I think the, the language is relatively clear and the intent is certainly meant to be what was in the original Fast Tracks plan. Thank you. Uh, Director Nirmela. Yeah, I'm just also trying to understand what the process would be to, if, if there is going to be something that's under delivering what was originally envisioned for the B line in particular, what, what does that process look like? Who is engaged in the conversation on Define if there needs to be a redefinition, because I would say there are several of us cities who've, who've built, we've done the field of dreams situation, we've built the transit centers, we have the density, but nothing has come. Um, and so, you know, 55 trains versus six trains that don't, that doesn't have bi-directionality and perhaps doesn't, won't have the ridership that we need to actually prove out the reason for doing a peak rail line. Um, I just, I, you know, there's frustration, but there's also a feeling that we're not involved. And who, where are the voices of the communities in the actual decision? Thank you for that question. I'll let Michael correct me if I, if I don't get this right. But I can tell you for certain that there are two governing bodies that will be involved without question, the RTD Board of Directors and the Dr. Cog Board of Directors. The RTD Board cannot take any action 
on any segment or any further uh, expansion of our system without approval of the Dr. Cog board. So you, I would envision a process that would, that would begin at the, the RTD board with the 15 elected board members, and then, then it would go through a process um, which is in addition to the traditional role that you have as directors when you approve modifications to Metro Vision and to the Regional Transportation Plan, you have a higher level of responsibility as Dr. Cog board directors to approve whatever RTD wants to do. So it's my understanding as well that a supermajority vote of the RTD board is required to expend any additional funds on fast track. So that would include system expansion or any other expenditure of the fast track's internal savings account. As long as I've been at RTD, it's always taken a supermajority. So I hope that explains a little bit better. I'm going to ask Michael if he can explain if there's anything else in the legislation that describes any other role that any other body would have besides the RTD board and the Dr. Cog board. Uh, nothing further in the legislation, but your concern is certainly a driving point of what RTD had in mind when we set up the peak service study, knowing that we weren't going to be able to deliver the full 55 trains per day. That's really what led to the compromise of this peak service study. What can we do in the, in the near term? And in setting up that study, we specifically made sure that each individual city assigned staff that sit and really guide that entire study. So you, your staff from the cities that are along the corridor are participating and really are in charge of making all decisions with the study. So I, I just add that as a, a piece to make sure that we're doing this in collaboration so that we're all aware and got, end with a common set of facts. And I, um, one thing that our staff has asked for, but um, several times is that we understand what the directional split is on existing transit service along this corridor. And we have um, a natural split in direction in Westminster, uh, you know, some going, half going to Denver, half going to Boulder. And the question keeps, com keeps coming up, are we going the right direction with this peak rail service to actually maximize the ridership? And especially post COVID, where are people going? And if, again, we're utilizing the ridership of the, this is a pilot service, which is supposed to show that there's ridership and therefore prove up the need for, you know, the potential. Um, I'm just, th th this has come up and, and it's just, we don't want to put our eggs in the wrong basket. Thank you for that question. We will be working with the Denver Regional Council of Governments. And one of the things that we don't have are brand new models yet that reflect the conditions. You're, you're, you're referencing something that has changed. We know that peak hour, peak direction work trips are different, perhaps even than when the most recent time we looked at these projects. So that's, that's got to be considered for sure before there's a decision made on what the service plan would look like. We don't want to have a service plan that doesn't meet the needs of the more the shifts that we've all experienced in what's going on. Madam Chair, can I, I just add to that yes. that Brian mentioned with regards to the modeling? Um, so we are in the process right now. Actually, it's ongoing, right, Ron? We're doing household surveys right now out on the street in the region, and those those new household surveys we're hoping is going to shed some light on new travel patterns within this region, which will be used ultimately to calibrate and validate our travel demand forecasting models. So, and that's what Brian was referring to. That's the new models that they will be utilizing for, for their work going forward. And hopefully too, if there's public comment on those models as they're created, that we'll make sure to capture things where it may not have been quite exactly what they thought they were answering on that survey, so. Uh, Director Odoricio. Thank you. Um, as uh, I have a lot of the same questions that uh, Director Nermella asked. Um, Adams County is gonna have a lot of the same questions, but I will ask again, just for clarity and confirmation, the FISA account is specifically going to be dedicated, plus these additional funds, to finishing including the North Line. And, and, and so it's the North Line, the Northwest Line, and all the fast tracks. But I, I kind of also am concerned about how we define finished. 
uh, like Austin mentioned, um, because it is important that the, the entire negotiation of this entire deal uh, based on finishing the north, the northwest line, and other parts of fast track. Um, I just want to make sure that we're confirming that, right? Thank you for the question. I'm going to start and then and then let Michael uh, illuminate on anything related to the legislation. If you recall from the 2004 plan, Fast Tracks had three primary pillars. One was system expansion, which included rail and uh, the US 36, which is now known as the Flatiron Flyer. It included park and rides. That was an, that was the second major component, and we've added thousands and thousands of parking spaces, as you know. The third that that people don't remember is familiar was called Fast Connects, and that was intended to be increases in bus connections to the rail expansion. So when it comes to what what the choices are for the fast tracks, four tenths of a percent, it can be spent on any of those items that are included. And there is a lot of focus for good reason, I understand, on on the, on the completion of the rail the rail expansions. There's four of those uh, left in the program. However, there still is, you could spend some of the fast tracks money on fast connects, the bus part. You could theoretically spend it on park and rides, but I don't, I don't anticipate that would occur. I, what I'd like Michael to do is just see if there's any inflection in the legislation that could maybe shift the narrative a bit, but it's really up to the, Dr. Cog, the, the RTD board of directors and then ultimately Dr. Cog to decide what would go next with fast tracks because the board of directors has never prioritized uh, another dollar of, of how that money should be spent. When North Metro was completed in 2020, that was the last big decision on, on how fast tracks would move forward. But Michael, could you add? Thanks, Brian. And, and there isn't really anything specific in the legislation saying exactly you know, what defines finished or not. I think RTD will always remain committed to finishing the full program. But again, if there was a hypothetical scenario here, but you know, if, if you only have enough money out of the legislation and with existing RTD dollars on this, and it was only available to complete a certain portion of it, you know, that, that's what that would complete at that time. But again, RTD would remain committed to finishing it, but it just it depends on the economics of the, the full project. Okay. Um, you have to have a plan of action on how to complete fast tracks by 2032, four? Yeah, 2034. 2034. And that includes all of those things on the list, not just some of them. Correct. Okay. Um, With the prioritization of Northwest and n -Line. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Director Peck? Thank you. Um, could you clarify, you said that the fast tracks funds could also be used for park and rides? Specifically talking about park and rides for buses or park and rides for rail? Or both. So any, any park and ride that supported the identified corridors in the 2004 plan are eligible for fast tracks funding. So could you uh, check on that for me? Because I thought that the base funds were only for the bus portion. So yeah, that is. So those parking rides for the buses terminals would be perfect, but I didn't realize that the fast track funds could be used for the rail lines. Yeah, they can definitely be used for to support both bus and rail I, I said that wrong. I, I just totally said it opposite, <laughs> that um, the bus needs to come out of the base rather than the fast tracks funding. Not necessarily. The, for example, we, we expended fast tracks funds to build and improve park and rides for the Flatiron Flyer. That is totally different from what I have, have been told. So I'll just, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you for the, thank you for the question. Other questions? All right, thank you very much. Next item is state legislative issues, legislative wrap up. Thank goodness they're finished. 
<laughs> thank you, Rich. Director of Legislative Affairs, thank you. If Rich is mosey enough to the microphone there. Um, listen, we weren't, we're not going to go into great detail with any of these bills, of course, because I don't want you to have to relive some of them. But I, <laughs> but I, but I will tell you that you know we'll we'll just hit on some Dramatic. of the highlights based on the various sections that we have. Um, or, that's your word, not mine, Madam Chair. Um, but I, you know, we we just we we do want to just hit on those because listen, I'll, I'll be honest. I think we had some wins in the legislative session. Yeah. You know, with yeah, regards sure. to I think. Um, some of the bills that we had a lot of anxiety about that we were able to make a little more palatable for folks. And I and Rich, just if I may, just take a, just a, a minute here. I also I want to mention and hopefully provide you some comfort that you have some really good people in other associations that work for you to do this type of work. Staff at CML, CCI, CCAT, CC4CA, alphabet soup of associations. They've been wonderful through this whole trend. We've, we've, you know, we've spent more time with them um, as a group this legislative session probably more than ever. And uh, so they, they're really good people. Heather Stouffer in particular, I want to call her out for the work that she did on uh, Senate Bill, or sorry, House Bill uh, 1313 as well as, um, what was their Senate Bill? Uh, 174. 174, um, I think, which we do think is a really good bill. Um, I think they did, did great work. So go ahead, Rich. But thanks. Um, uh, so I'm going to say a few words about uh, the aging, the major aging bills, and then ask Jen to start on uh, some, some comments about the transportation and housing bills. Um, and, and first of all, I want to thank Jen and Ed about it she's not here tonight for all of their help there was there at times when there was so much going on in in all kinds of different directions it was hard to keep track of it all and they really helped us a, a lot so i want to thank them and thank the board for all of the work that that so many of you and your colleagues did actually even before the session working on these bills but also the aging bills and the efforts we did uh, we pushed for the funding so, so quickly, um, I think the first uh, few bills, both whether you're looking at the matrix or the, the wrap up, um, the comments about the, the long bill, the budget, and about Senate Bill 40 and Senate or House Bill 1211 sort of all fold together on that issue of AAA funding and the challenges that were being faced and are still being faced. Um, what, we're, what we're left with, as Doug mentioned, was the $2 million uh, in the budget and um, House Bill 1211, which creates a contingency fund for emergencies, also has $2 million in it. Um, but that's money that, that AAAs or a provider under AAA would have to apply for in an emergency situation. Um, so I'll, and I'll just mention, like, going forward, really there's work for us to do again uh, with Senate Bill 40 still has um, a, a, essentially a study in, in it that uh, it requires the Department of Human Services, uh, Office of State Planning and, and Budgeting to work with the area agencies on aging over the next three months to evaluate the adequacy of state funding for senior services and that's the first time we've ever had anything formal like that. Of course the bill hasn't been signed yet but I haven't heard anything otherwise. Um, and so we're going to be working hard on that over the summer. Hopefully can increase our odds of getting something in, in the governor's budget this time around. Um, and, and so we're going to be doing that. The one other bill that's on that aging list was House Bill 1322, which uh, re references uh, HICPA for the health care policy and financing. Uh, working on a waiver process to the feds to be able to pay for cover services for food, nutrition, housing, and rental assistance that they can draw down federal funds for those 
and they're interested in potentially looking, working with what they would call non-traditional Medicaid providers. So we don't know if it's going to pan out for uh, us, but, but it is something that the AAA, I think, might look into. I know Jayla's a little skeptical because we haven't always had the best experiences with them, but um, it's one of those other kinds of things, just looking at other opportunities for funding, not just appropriations and the, and, and the budget because we've seen how hard it is and I'm not sure it's going to get any easier. It might get harder down the road. So it's something we need to look at. Uh, and so with that, Jen, do you want to make a couple comments on transportation and housing? Yes, absolutely. So on the housing bills, housing land use, uh, most of the legislation that was introduced and that passed this year really was around um, Governor Polis's big land use bill from last year. Um, he broke up that bill into several different bills um, there with not as many mandates and not as much, um, you know, overreach with local control issues as well. So um, we did see the passage of parking minimums, ADUs, CMLs, um, strategic growth and housing assessment needs bill, um, occupancy limits as well, too. And then, as we know, the big one, the TOC bill, House Bill 1313, um, which made it all the way to the end of the, the last day of the session, um, that bill was very much narrowed. The sticks were removed. There's a lot of flexibility um, to local governments and how they implement that bill. Um, so that was, that was the big land use bill. No construction defect bills passed this year of note. And then on the transportation transit side, we did hear from RTD the two big bills that do provide a lot of funding for transit um, and rail big wins for transit um, this session. One other bill as well, too, that we did track was Senate Bill 32, um, which um, it makes permanent the ozone free season grant program, as well as creates a zero fare grant program um, to provide um, zero or free fares, I should say, to, to youth, those individuals under 19. In that bill as well, too, we were fortunate to be able to amend and it, well, I guess we had an amendment in the bill that would extend the employer tax credit that provides for alternative transportation options, options for their employees. So we did get that extension into that bill as well. But then it got taken out. But then it got taken in out? The Senate. I mean, it got put on in the Senate, got taken out in the House, and we thought, oh, well, and this was at the very end of the session. We thought, oh, well, we tried. Well, we'll have to deal with it. Uh, during the summer, maybe with the Transportation Legislation Review Committee. And then all of a sudden, we found out it was like, I don't know, the second to the last day of the session. Or, yeah, I think it was because it was a, that the, in the Senate, uh, the Senate sponsor put on a third reading amendment to House Bill 1036, which was a more omnibus uh, tax credit and uh, bill that had a whole bunch of different things in it. And he got a two-year extension. We had originally had a four-year extension, uh, but he got a two-year extension put into it. So that gives us some breathing room be to get uh, Department of Revenue to do the rulemaking. And so we can uh, really start pushing that. And I think Steve, I had Steve and Doug too, I guess, on such a roller coaster during the session with, with, that, with that issue. Um, but uh, hopefully, it, it it gives them some some room to work on that. Right. Yep. Absolutely. And then we did not see uh, the RTD governance reform bill go through. We did. We certainly spent a lot of time on that bill even before session started. That one did not make it across the finish line. And then, Rich, I did fail to mention we were successful in in getting one amendment into the TOC bill. Yeah, and I'll, I'll mention that because um, I had started talking with Director Hazeman about it before the meeting and didn't get a chance to finish, so I promised him I'd mention it. Um, when, uh, when House Bill 13, 13 was on second reading in the Senate, I think there were something like nine amendments that they adopted on the floor. One of those amendments uh, added the uh, ability of uh, area agencies on aging that would be working through a local government applying for the infrastructure grants, I think they're called, uh, to be eligible to receive some of that grant funding for a project or services that obviously are consistent with, with the TOC uh, intent of the bill. So that was just one more thing that kind of came out of nowhere for us. Um, 
that um, potentially could provide some opportunities for AAAs. And I would just echo, Doug, that we really did have a very successful session. I mean, I think that's a reflection of our reputation down at the Capitol with the board and certainly with staff members. So thank you. You make my job easier. That's all we got, unless you have comments or questions. <laughs> questions? <laughs> All right. Um, Chair, if I may just real quick, I, I listen, there are some legislators that, I mean, I think it, it's it's worthy of giving a little shout out to some of the work that they, they did on our behalf. Um, I, I mean, we truly appreciate it. I think on the older adult side, we have Senator Danielson that's always been a very strong supporter of our, our AAA program. Senator Danielson, Senator Janal. And on the uh, JBC side, uh, Representative Byrd, S Senator Zenzinger, Senator Kirkmeyer have been very, very good to work with. I mean, they know us, right? Most of them are family, quite frankly. They've been part of the Dr. Cog board in some fashion through the years. And then on the transportation side, too, I mean, really, I mean, you know, Senator Winter was great. Senator okay. Lindstedt was obviously very, okay. very influential in the conversations that we've had. So I, I know I'm missing some, of course, but... You know, it, it, I, I think it does, to Jen's point, I think it speaks to the respect that they have for the work that you all do as local governments and as part of this organization. So I want to thank you. I would like to start a conversation sometime fairly early in the summer about, um, you know, how we bring bills to you all and what bills we bring to you all. There seems, in my mind, there should be some type of more formal process of how bills end up on our list. Um, other than me saying, yeah, okay, that one sounds good. It seems, I don't I know, I've always Doug, seemed a little this uncomfortable on. with that. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> flip, flip a coin. So, and, and, and being more nimble, right, during the legislative session, because we only meet once a month, right? And so I, I would like to at least have it, initiate a conversation, maybe through a board work session or something about that. So stay tuned. And you make a very good point, because I think one of the reasons that we were successful to the extent that we were in the legislature because we anticipated housing issues yeah. uh, last year really made got some traction this year through the friendly legislators yeah. so i i think that to the extent that we can have our crystal ball prepared and shined up we might actually get some some groundwork laid before legislature starts in on us again. So, and I saw Director Odoricio had a question. I, I just want to reiterate the fact that Doug Rex and and the team, all the team, but particularly Doug Rex was meeting with these leaders in these local government organizations and legislators throughout the entire summer, and into this entire um, this entire session. And I can tell you the feedback that I got from legislators and from peers and colleagues was that Doug Rex did an outstanding job representing us and making sure that when we said no to HUTF and when we said here's the data and when we said we have better ideas and ways to address some of the objectives to achieve some of the objectives that you want to get to, they listened because they know they can trust Doug Rex to be honest, straightforward and competent backed by an outstanding staff. And I just want everyone here to know that it was an outstanding year. And if you recall, only a few months ago, we thought they would be using HUTF as a stick over our heads. And we were all concerned. And I gotta tell you, Doug Rex and staff, particularly Doug Rex, I wanna say, all right. I wanna say right. thank you. <laughs> and I think we could give him a round of applause for that kind of leadership. You're here. <laughs> Director, thank you so very much. And as you, everybody in this room knows, it's an absolute team effort. Ron Papstorf and Sheila Lynch and our staff Absolutely. on the transportation Absolutely. and housing bills were unbelievable. Their conversations, communication with, uh, with, with the governor's office and, and the like. But, yeah. Director, Absolutely. thank you so very much for acknowledging the great work that our staff does. Thank you. Other questions? All right, you will note that uh, there are informational items in your packet, uh, letter K and L, and now we'll move on to committee reports. Uh, chair requests that these reports be brief. 
uh, reflect decisions made and information uh, that is pertinent to the business of Dr. Cog. First report is from the stack, Steve Odoricio. Yeah, I want to thank uh, Director Mills, who uh, was our alternate this month uh, and who attended. Also, I uh, want to thank Ron Papsdorf uh, for his outstanding uh, support in that on, on the stack in both preparation before the meetings and afterwards. At the stack this uh, last week, uh, we were presented by the CDOT 2050 statewide transportation plan, um, and it was noted that the plan is something that is needed, and it also takes into the input of that plan is what we do here at the Dr. Cog level from the MPOs. Um, rather than it being top down, it goes from the bottom up. And so uh, we were able to provide, um, in the work that is done here, just want you to know, does feed that effort up at the CDOT level, which determines investment priorities and a broad policy framework. So we want to thank the folks uh, for Dr. Cog uh, for helping feed that very good uh, CDOT plan. The next one is that CDOT was briefed. Um, they briefed the stack on some of the multimodal Transportation and Mitigation Options Fund, that's the MMOF, and there were some changes made to the local match, but uh, good advocacy and discussions, particularly with uh, the locals and the folks on the stack, was to make sure that those existing projects uh, were not having to change the goalposts on them on that match, and I think that was a big win for folks is that while that match the criteria may change, um, it doesn't change for those who already started. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Metro Mayors, Bud Starker. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, the uh, caucus has not met since our last board meeting, and I will conclude my report. Thank you very much. Uh, Metro Area County Commissioners, the MAC, George Teal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, there were uh, three items on the last agenda, which occurred on Friday, April 19th. Uh, there was an update on the migrant crisis response from Evan Dreyer, the city and county of Denver. There was a uh, uh, RTD briefing uh, delivered by Eric Davidson of the Regional Transport Chair. And very similar, I'm told, at least with what we received last month. And then uh, there were two legislation updates, and uh, MAC agreed to draft letters of support for House Bill 24-1322 and House Bill 24-1371. It's my report. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, the Advisory Committee on Aging, Jayla Sanchez Warren. Good evening. Uh, in my report or in, at the ACA meeting, I gave a report. I thanked everyone for helping us advocate for more funding. There were so many people that wrote letters and made contacts and we're so grateful for that. I explained how we ended up with $2 million because the numbers were all over the place for a while, um, which brought about 800000 extra dollars in services for the Area Agency on Aging here in Dr. Cog. Um, the, the ACA reviewed the recommendations of the ACA funding subcommittee. Uh, you've heard a little bit about that. Uh, they, they looked at the recommendations for allocating the state and federal dollars in the areas of nutri nutrition, transportation, in-home services, caregiver services, information assistance, legal services, and material aid. The committee passed the recommendation and moved the list uh, to the Budget and Finance Committee for final approval. You know, uh, we have $7.5 million, as we've talked about a few times tonight, uh, less in 20, fiscal year 25 than we did in 24, and that means several services were cut and some were not funded at all. That included a very, one of those programs that wasn't funded, a very successful fall prevention program called Nimble. Uh, primarily because it's not a must fund under the Older Americans Act. Fall prevention is not a must fund. While this is a very important prevention and strength building program, and because older adults love it and tens of thousands of people use it in this region because we pay for their subscription, 
I've been very motivated to try and find a way to keep it. Um, and the good news is we are working with Kaiser Permanente and Nimble to keep this important service. Now, I don't want to give you false hope because we have a long way to go. Boy, it is not easy to get approval for services in Kaiser Permanente, but um, it's actually a monumental feat. <laughs> um, but we're hopeful. We're really hopeful. I've had a number of conversations with them that they might fund the program for the region or maybe even the entire state, which would be wonderful. This was actually a short meeting for us because um, – we spent the second half of our meeting celebrating the 50th birthday of the Area Agency on Aging. We had cake, and I gave a presentation on the history of the AAA. I have been here 36 years of the 50 years, um, so I could, I could do some of that. Um, and, and we had a good time. It was a lot of fun. That's my report. Oh, Thank wait you. a second. One more thing. Um, most of you, and I'm sorry, Cam, I could not find any more of these cards, have a, uh, a little card in front of you. I wanted to know, do you know caregiver, caregivers are on the rise, right? 38% of workers report that they do some level of caregiving for a loved one. 17% say um, they act as full-time caregivers who are full-time employees and full-time caregivers. It costs 25 $2 billion in lost productivity, 6.6 .6 working days per year, and 126 million missed working days. I want to let you know this is a resource for you and your local governments. If you have people on your staff that would be interested in, in navigating the world of caregiving, which is really difficult, there, uh, and I know, um, uh, Many of you are, have already done that or are going through the process yourselves. We can help navigate that. We can pro provide training for your staff. We can provide support for your staff. I just want you to know it's out there and available for you. Um, if you're interested, give me a call or uh, call the number on the card. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, report from the RAC, Doug Grex. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the RAC had its regular meeting on May 3rd. Um, like everybody else, we discussed legislative items associated with air quality. Um, but the one thing I really wanted to point out was that we had a presentation from um, a Dr. Anthony Gerber. He's a professor of medicine at National Jewish Health and University of Colorado. Um, he's also director of research pulmonary division at National Jewish Health. He was unbelievable. It's the best presentation I've seen on kind of the status of air quality and health within our region. Um, I'm going to try to tee him up here for this for, for for the board. He was that good. I think he would provide a lot of very good information, very very data rich presentation. So so smart. So I'll, I'll try to tee him up. Uh, just kind of a FYI for now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, report from E470, Deborah Mulvey. Good evening. The E-470 board met on May 9th. Uh, we were proud to celebrate Madam Chair Winshaw as a member of the E-470 board representing Lone Tree, and the board agreed she will be sorely missed and is a great addition to the board. The financial items reviewed were the audit and a bond authorization. The contracts reviewed related to sideways, si roadway sign maintenance and IT staffing and other IT contracts. And the board is getting closer to finding a new executive director. We hope to have that announcement in the coming month. Thank you very much. Uh, CDOT, uh, Darius Patbas, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, the commission met for its uh, May workshop meeting this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, there was a robust uh, presentation on the US-50 bridge that had some issues and had to be closed down for safety reasons and talking about the uh, detour routing and what's next with that. So uh, I would encourage folks that if they're interested in that topic to take a look at the YouTube piece on there. Uh, additionally, um, uh, kicking off the statewide 2050 plan, um, won't go into too much detail on that uh, because uh, uh, we've kind of already talked about that in the other piece on there, but there was uh, uh, initial conversations on setting up the the overall goals for the for that and uh, discussions on program distribution. Um, 
for the multimodal options fund. Uh, again, the match reduction update and also the distribution formula will be up for consideration by the commission tomorrow. So those funds and notification can be given to uh, not only our MPOs, but the TPRs around the state on distribution of those funds. Um, in addition to taking a look at um, the actual allocation on what happened with the legislature on some of the uh, changes on, on those funds as well. So it's kind of a two-step process. And then finally, the big one is the finalization of the decision by the commission on the CDOT planning rule. Uh, just as a reminder, this was required under House Bill 23-1101 last year. Um, the rule has been open for public comment, um, and they'll take decision on the recommendations, which include administrative recommendations and changes to uh, a couple of the rural planning regions tomorrow. And uh, I think the last item is uh, the field impact enterprise will meet, and we'll discuss a very minor administrative item in preparation to allocate funds to local governments uh, in the coming months. And that concludes my report, Chair. Thank you so much. And now, RTD, Brian Welch. <laughs> now we're done, almost. <laughs> Home stretch. Good news for Fast Tracks. Last week, the Colorado Court of Appeals uh, ruled in RTD's favor in the $111 million claim that was filed by Denver Transit Partners over the beginning of the, uh, the A-Line project. So that's great news for the, for the project and for the program. Wow, that was fast. Well, so uh, a couple of things. Thank you for all you do. Thank you to staff for all you do. Uh, concise presentations, no spelling errors. I love this. So <laughs> uh, please stay for a quick photo up here in the corner uh, before you grab your parking chip from Cam. Uh, and if there are, oh, our next meeting is not in June. It is July 17th. There are no other matters by members. It is 8.46 and we are adjourned. Thank you.